Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Sunday Evening Lecture Series made available to you by the Stonington Free Library. Good afternoon, my name is Willard Spiegelman. On behalf of the Merrill House Committee, I'm happy to welcome you here for this afternoon's reading. I have two announcements before I introduce um, our readers. And the first is something, adjustments. The first is something both historical and personal. I don't know how many of you in the house today feel a certain frisson or th thrill or shudder on April the 14th every year. April the 14th, 1865, was the day the president was shot at Ford's Theater, and he died the following morning. And April 14th, 1912, was the day the Titanic hit the iceberg <laughs> and went down the following morning. <laughs> and in the days when I used to teach, I tried to make that day coincide with teaching either Whitman's When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloom or Thomas Hardy's The Convergence of the Twain, which were very significant poems. That was my first historical announcement. Uh, the second announcement is that I will turn the program over briefly to our master librarian, the Queen of Stonington Library, <laughs> Belinda Decay, who has an announcement of her own to make. Thank you, Willard. Um, I did note the word briefly. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess I'm gatecrashing my own party, but the Merrill House very graciously allowed me to say this, because um, Willard's just mentioned two important dates. But today is a, is a very significant day in the life of the library, and I want to share this story with you. Can you hear me? I'm not very good at this. <coughs> Actually, um, I expect you all know, most of you know, that we have in the gallery here a memorial poetry corner for Sandy McClatchy, who actually died April 10th, a year ago. So this is a very, very appropriate day to be making this announcement. And following his death, um, Chip Kidd and Jonathan Post came into the library in a very sad moment and asked me if I had any ideas what they might do with Sandy's library. And so between us, we came up with this idea to take a core collection and put it up in our gallery and make it a permanent memorial for Sandy. And these books do not circulate, but they're available for the whole world to come and browse, think about, think about all these books that meant so much to him. And so th with the help of um, our friends at the Merrill House and the Stonington Village Improvement Association and Jonathan Post, who is not here so he can't deny it, <laughs> but, um, he actually was very, very significant in getting this done. So that was that. And then a few weeks ago, a patron, friend, and neighbor called Robert Palm walked in the door and said, I have Sandy's typewriter. Mm -hmm. And Robert conceived of this very beautiful idea 
of giving the typewriter to the library so that people could come in, browse the collection, and then maybe <coughs> sit down and write a poem of their own. And then these poems would be collected at the desk, and then every three months, six months, they would be read and judged by a poet, and maybe put in our e-librarian. Anyway, to this kind of perpetuating Sandy's life and perpetuating poetry. And I have to tell you, as a director of the library, Robert did not only conceive of the idea, he executed it in every single detail. There was none of this, shall we? So um, <laughs> he, he put together these two wonderful signs. They are actually upstairs. Um, this is the cover. You can see it if you go upstairs. One sign is the cover of Sweet Theft. J.D. Matachi's Magpie Nest of Literary Sides, Quotations and Wordplay, book, and the book design and jacket photo is by Chip Kidd. And in the photo is the typewriter and Sandy's arm, <coughs> hand, and pen. So, I mean, this is so incredibly beautiful. And to be able to announce this on this day is so important. So, and the other thing that, that Robert wrote up was this typewriter was owned and used by the late poet Lady McCatchy, some of whose work is on the shelves in the corner. We'd like to think he'd be pleased that it is still in use, that young people especially can further the art to which he dedicated his life. There are no rules, but a few suggestions Read a few of his poems, or James Merrill's, Elizabeth Bishop's, Robert Lowell's, or W.H. Auden's. Imagine connections among them, and their connection to Stonington. Then write a poem of your own. <laughs> when you're done, leave it downstairs with one of the librarians. If you'd like to be part of the Poets Corner competition, write your name and email address below your work. Happy typing. <laughs> so, a very special thank you to Robert Palm for completing, completing a circle, I think. So, and then lastly, talking of judging poems, I would like to welcome today Margaret Gibson, who's just been made Connecticut Poet Laureate. <laughs> Because I feel she could hardly say no, has offered to help with the judging. <laughs> <laughs> and I promised her that was not a lifelong commitment. <laughs> so, um, thank you so much. It wasn't as brief as we hoped, but <laughs> I will exit left, pursued by a bear. <laughs> once said when I asked him why he played with the score in front of him, he said, well, I've memorized it, so I should have the score too. <laughs> I wonder whether the benefaction included a lifetime supply of typewriter ribbons, yes. because you can't find typewriter ribbons. No. It was a complete execution of this idea. We have typewriter ribbons and beautiful paper. I mean, a chair and a <laughs> Thank you, Robert. In my life, I've attended hundreds and hundreds of literary readings and given dozens and dozens of introductions, but I've never had the challenge or the pleasure of presenting a pair of related writers. 
Looking back, I wonder what other pairs would have been fun to introduce. <laughs> William and Dorothy Wordsworth, perhaps? Or Dante Gabriel and Christina Rossetti? But they were siblings. Virginia and Leonard Wolfe, perhaps? But they were both prose writers. Maybe Robert Penn Warren and Eleanor Clark? Or Robert Lowell and Elizabeth Hardwick. In any case, this is my first and perhaps my only foray into the genre, and I will try to keep my remarks both separate and brief. I will introduce both of them now and then sit down. Both of our readers have had distinguished literary and scholarly careers. Both were undergraduates at Trinity College. Both have been on the faculty at Rochester for several decades. Both have won many prizes, Guggenheim's for both, the MacArthur Genius Award for one, though they're both geniuses. <laughs> and you can find out all of this resume stuff by going online or reading the dust jackets of their books. I first became aware of Jim Longenbach when I read his first scholarly book, published, I didn't know this at the time, before he was 30, they are both wunderkinder, this couple, on Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot, and his even more impressive second critical book, published a couple months later, called The Stone Cottage, on when Ezra Pound was uh, Yeats's secretary. In 1998, his first book of poems, Threshold, was published, and others have followed. It was one of my great pleasures as a literary editor to have presented to the world the initial appearances of some of Jim's creations in the pages of the Southwest Review. As what we would now call a person rather than a man of letters, Jim has earned his place in the line of poet critics that goes back to Dr. Johnson and follows through Matthew Arnold T.S. Eliot and Randall Jarrell. As a poet, he belongs to the tradition that includes Wallace Stevens and James Merrill. Consider the opening of a 2007 poem whose title, Buried Life, from Draft of a Letter, echoes one of Arnold's most famous poems. It begins, Imagine cities you've inhabited, streets paved in Iowa stone, now imagine yourself returning to those same cities. This is a poem, like many of his, of reminiscence and retrieval. It's dipped into, but not drenched in, memory. Or consider a recent poem from The New Yorker from December 18th last year called 112th Street. It begins, if only once, if you ever have the chance, you should climb a volcano, the hermitage at base camp, the glasses of brandy. That's the past. Who wants to think of the past? And I point out that the volcano and the hermitage are both stolen right from Wallace Stevens. <laughs> Who wants to think of the past? Well, he does. And he proceeds to think about the past, and the poem ends this way. Once, walking up Broadway, late at night, both of us a little drunk, flurries in the air, Christmas trees lining the sidewalk, block after block. At every corner, you kissed me. Then the light would change. The light would change. The changing light has special resonance for us in Stonington, of course, and the gentle but powerful lines of this poem of reminiscence and love not only nods in the direction of our local poet of the changing light, but also makes a bow to someone like a lover, perhaps a wife, perhaps Joanna Scott, <laughs> to whom I now turn, <laughs> or perhaps to someone else. <laughs> Six weeks ago, in this very room, I opened Careers for Women, Joanna's novel, recent novel, that weaves memory, history, environmental concerns, and a cast of memorable characters 
into a fabric that traces the interwoven lines of a half dozen people over the course of decades. In the very first paragraph, you'll find an evocative image of all those cigarettes we all used to smoke. I'm quoting, the powdery segment that clung to the end of her cigarette like a young bear hanging on a branch too narrow to support its weight. I immediately thought, aha, a novelist with a gift for metaphor, one who thinks like a poet, or perhaps is married to a poet. <laughs> The gift of metaphor is one among many on full display in this novel, whose dust jacket mentions another gift that has marked all of Joanna's work, her ability to register the powerful, small mercies of friendship and compassion. One of the main characters, the cigarette smoker I just mentioned, is a woman who heads the PR division of New York's Port Authority, a woman both draconian and kind, who tells her staff one secret of her success as someone who is capable of persuading an audience to do what she wants. She says, I had to put myself in his place. Aha, I said. In other words, a PR genius is exactly like, well, like a novelist, <laughs> whose sympathies must extend far and wide. Another of Joanna's gifts is the ability to layer or weave her story, darting in and out of different times and different places with characters who at first seem disconnected, but who, it turns out, are all parts of the same story. Towards the end of the book, one of these characters is presenting another some information crucial to understanding a past tragedy. Quote, he said that if he were the one aiming to find meaning in the confusing morass of life, he just might consider arranging the pieces in accordance with the force of association rather than in obedience to the order of time, which is exactly what this novelist with a poet's gift does in this work finding meaning in the confusing morass of life. The force of association, another term for metaphor, of course, is what leads her on in the unrolding of her revelations. It is also the force of the decades-old Scott Longenbach Association, which is what we shall enjoy this evening. I introduce you to the Scott Longham box in whichever order they wish to come up to the podium. <laughs> Thank you, Willard. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Great. Just wave wildly if anything happens. Willard has been a friend of mine for 30 years, so it's a great pleasure to be introduced by him. I relied on him in other ways all through those decades. Uh, it's also a pleasure and an honor to be here and to look out and see the faces of people who have become our dear friends. We feel like we've been here a long time and we do not want to leave. <laughs> uh, so we won't, <laughs> if, if we can help it. Uh, I'd like also to remember Sandy, who I knew uh, since I was in school, and uh, it's just nice to think of him here. Um, I, I'm going to read uh, two poems, maybe three. We'll see how it goes. And uh, the first one is from my most recent book, Earthling. It's called The Crocodile. It's in, uh, I suddenly can't remember. Yes, five sections, <laughs> none of them too very long. Uh, and the, the third section is in a dialogue between two different voices, or more properly aspects of the mind, and I'll, you know, kind of do this sort of thing to <laughs> signify that. Uh, you'll see that I have an intimate relationship with this beast. The Crocodile. One. What I wanted was to lift my body in unnatural postures high above the earth, to dance, to live beyond ideas, Imagine feeling assured you were beautiful. 
girls wanted to run their fingers over my skin. Also guys, I bit off their hands. <laughs> if called to, I could wait beneath the water a long time. I could let a bird pick leeches from my tongue. So in the moment of youth, when other people embrace passion, I fell back on discipline. My throat was capable of many different sounds, but the pleasure was in keeping silent, letting parts of me be seen. Sometimes a plover mistook me for a log, but that's not deception. I really look like a log. I survived the great extinctions. I pretended to be myself. To let you know me, I need only move my eyes. Two. Like me, you had a father and a mother. You grew up in a particular place, a particular time. Your skin displays the scars of that place. You've decapitated chickens, eviscerated live fish. You carry yourself with what to other people seems a plum, but the impulse driving such behaviors, necessary in themselves, has infiltrated daily life. In arguments, you'll drag another person underwater until he drowns. Though I grew very large, though I developed great capacity of mind, I was afraid of my mother. Afraid not just of scrutiny, but of being the object of someone's pride. What was I protecting? She was willful, yes, but tiny, generous to a fault. In Egypt, the family crocodiles were adorned with bracelets, earrings of molten gold, then mummified, laid out in the tombs. The word itself is from the Greek, crocodalus, pebble worm. Three. What manner of thing is your crocodile? It is shaped, sir, like itself. And it is as broad as it has breadth. It is just so high as it is and moves with its own organs. It lives by that which nourishes it, and the elements once out of it, it transmigrates. What color is it of? Of its own color, too. Tis a strange serpent. Tis so, and the tears of it are wet. Four. As a child, I was given a stuffed crocodile. Don't think this strange. Most people have dolls resembling themselves. <laughs> <laughs> My sister had one too. Tiny marbles filled the sockets of its eyes. The skin was stitched together up the belly where it's soft. And though it was only a foot, perhaps 10 inches long, the jaws were clamped together with a tack. Presumably this kept the little row of teeth from hurting you, but the tack protruded from the bottom of its chin, sharper than any tack. I remember rubbing over it, back and forth. When my mother died, I was right beside her, She'd been unconscious for a day. My sister and my father were there too. I leaned down close to her left ear. I whispered, thank you for everything you did for me. Thank you especially for what you did for our girls. Then, immediately, the color left her face she was no longer in her body, and she sank beneath the lagoon. Five. Picture 
by way of analogy, a mountain range. Some interruption of traffic, perhaps a flood, has blocked the roads. But communication between the villages is maintained over steep footpaths, the kind used ordinarily by hunters, originally by their prey. Some people speak more openly by such inefficient means. And the steeper the path, the more arduous the climb, the more likely we are to believe them. Someday I won't be hungry. I'll watch an egret stepping through the reeds. The miser imagines there's a certain sum to fill his heart, but for sorrow there is no remedy. It requires what it cannot hope. We've known each other, Earth, a long time. When the light rests low on the Nile, the Ganges, the Everglades, I could be anywhere. Day is discontinued, motionless. A voice is what you have. There's a lot of water down oh, there. <laughs> <laughs> This is going to be a long night. <laughs> um, I wrote that poem probably almost 10 years ago now. And uh, by that point, I had reached that point in life that we all reach, that everybody knows. When not only one's parents reach the point of getting old and dying, but Friends, start, things start to happen, and you know, it's all around you. We all know this. We all know this. I knew this. And yet it seems shocking all the time. It's, it's as if you know the sky is blue, and then you're going, oh my god, the sky is blue. Uh, because one's relationship to mortality is, is, is profoundly one of awareness, and at the same time, profoundly one of crazy denial. Or at least that's what I found. And so I wrote, I found myself over some time recently writing this poem about that conundrum. Uh, it's called In the Dolomites. Uh, it's in ten little sections. I'm going to put this down here, maybe. And uh, it begins in the Dolomites in the mountains in the north of Italy and kind of goes down to the Venetian plain to Treviso and ends up in Venice itself, which is, of course, where you go to die, uh, <laughs> uh, all of us. Um, in the Dolomites, one. The afternoon walk, it turns out, may not have been a walk at all. Nor can I locate in the Dolomites the place where we met, although I remember it with a level of detail I reserve for things of consequence. Snow layered in the crevices, white against black. Impossible patches of green where grass showed through, and more impossible, the gentians, still blooming, yellow against green. For the color above our heads, heaven, the sky, I had no word for that. Nobody did. Remember, this happened a long time ago. Even if it existed in the world, in your eyes, blue did not exist yet in my mind. Two. I see a rectangular, steeply sloping meadow, and at the top of the meadow a cottage, and in front of the cottage door two women are standing, one with a kerchief on her head. Children are gathering flowers, a girl and a boy, the latter of whom is me. And because the girl has gathered the more prodigious bunch, 
I grab it from her. <laughs> she runs up the meadow in tears. To console her, the woman in a kerchief cuts a slice of black bread and slathers it with jam. I throw the flowers to the ground, run to the cottage, and ask to be given bread too. In fact, I am given some. The woman cuts the loaf with a long knife. Three. When you were young, you had a beautiful body. Don't imagine yourself proud. I had one too. Everybody did. <laughs> Just walking down the street or looking out the window, sitting on a train, was like staring into the sun. The glare was blinding. Modesty made nothing happen since the parts were more enticing than the whole. I read a lot of books. I drove long distances with the windows down. Who were the ones with golden eyes and sunlit hair, who lounged all day beside the river clearly doing something important, though it looked like nothing at all? Four. At twelve, I returned to Bolzano for the first time. Always I'd longed for the meadows of my childhood where I'd escaped from my father even when I could barely walk. But when I returned, something else excited me greatly. A thirteen-year-old girl, the daughter of my hosts, whom last I'd seen at four. Immediately I fell in love. My first infatuation, though I said nothing to anyone. After a few days, the girl returned to school, as soon I did too. But in the interim, I spent my afternoons wandering in the meadow, the mountains rising as they always had, abruptly from my feet. My fantasies were not directed at the future, but rather sought to improve the past. Five. Two children walking through the meadow where they were born, born there like animals, suckled by a she-wolf together in one bed, one bower. When one of them smiled, they both smiled. When one of them frowned, together they frowned, furrowed their brows, so serious, so stern. Then together they laughed. Together they ate. Together they slept. Their legs tangled up together, legs brown from the sun. Together they forgot the past. They invented the future, the bower, the bed. Then it was morning. One of us got in the car. One of us stood at the door and waved goodbye. Six. Knowledge, as the ancients remind us, is conventional. Not in the sense of arbitrary, but because it depends on qualities we cannot observe. Atom, from atomos, meaning indivisible. So if the atoms of water are slippery and smooth, the atoms of salt are pointed. White atoms also are smooth, black ones jagged, casting shadows, while the atoms of red things quiver like flame. On the color blue, Democritus is silent. So is Homer, who calls the sea Oenops, wine dark, or more literally, wine-looking. The hides of oxen, to our eyes brown or black, also he calls wine-dark. The sky he calls starry, broad, iron, or copper. Seven. I'm looking at a boy and girl, no longer boy and girl, Together they have not only the future, they have a past. 
She's reading letters he's written. He's leaning his hand around her neck. He's curling his arm behind his slender waist, his fingers emerging from my viewpoint just below her breast. Gently, they're touching her breast. Remember how that felt? Behind them a garden, the meeting, the pursuit. Is the shrubbery tended or overgrown? The columbines luxurious because they're trimmed? Yellow her bodice, green the trees. Are the branches closing off the sky or parting to reveal it? A smudge of blue. Eight. At this point in the narrative, I remember very little. Whole years fall away. The time, if you'll permit me the expression, stood still. Yes, there were children of our own. We moved to Treviso. Then it was morning. You were standing at the door. Why won't you come with me? Why must I go alone? Asked the first person ever to die. When finally I admit it to my shame, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. What had happened was almost nothing. But I'd never seen it. I had no word to describe it, although it was everywhere. Nine. The windows were open, the ledges of the balcony broad. The sweep of the canal and the flutter of the white curtains were an invitation to, I couldn't have said what, a reef over which had broken through long ages the billows of an angry sea. When the fog rising from the intervening plains and lagoons had lifted, there they were, towers and ramparts, battlements, pinnacles, the deepest of deep reds, the blackest black against a cobalt sky. Mountains, stars, calves, serpents, fever, war, fame, vice, adultery. These are among the things that cannot take the place of heaven, although people have tried. Ten. In my first life, my body was fresh, unaccustomed to itself. I learned to read, to make love, Maybe it was like this for you, too. In my second, I was asked to be older. When I advertised my interests, they proved interesting to other people. What interested me? The trees grew taller. The houses stayed the same. And when I was summoned again, I had to count out loud. Was this the fourth time? The fifth? A stranger remembered me. You lived here, he said, a long time ago. The trees had grown taller. The children were more beautiful than ever. Or had they always been so? Smiling at one another. Staring at the sky. Thank you very much for listening. Another great, the, the boy and the girl, that's me and Joanna. <laughs> well, another great pleasure of being here is that, yeah, I get, is that I get to read with Joanna, which I almost never get to do. <laughs>
Oh my gosh, there we were, 112th Street, drunk and <laughs> kissing, and you told them that. <laughs> you even put it in the New Yorker. <laughs> oh my gosh, thank you. This is what a, how, I, how, do, how do we say thank you to everybody? Um, it's been such a pleasure to, to be here. I've said the only way to say thank you is to get our own place with a very large dining room <laughs> and have multiple seatings so we can sign up, you know, five, seven, nine. So really, it's been amazing. We, we got here, we were told we'd, we'd see the change of seasons. In fact, we saw two changes of seasons. We arrived during a Hallmark season. And there, <laughs> the streets were covered with fake snow. And then when they were filming the, the next Christmas's movie. And so then they rolled up all the snow and went away. And then the real snow came. <laughs> and then that melted. And then uh, now spring is coming. And the wonderful fog, which I, I love, um, has really been a, a reviving experience for us here. It's been just unbelievable. And it, some of you know we have this little four-footed creature named Petey. Yeah, like they, you guys probably know more about us than we realize in this little village. Uh, but anyway, he, we thought we were losing him before we came. He's a very old dog. And he came to Stonington, and he got a spring in his step. And that's the way we feel, actually. Um, the, the James Merrill apartment has been an incredible place to work. Um, the uh, you feel the, the the spirits and the the can can thinking have does thinking have a ghost? Because <laughs> I feel it. <laughs> um, and so I've been working on uh, both of two projects actually a long prose work uh, for another time and then a collection of stories and I'll, I'll read you a, a story today a story. About 20 minutes long. Are, are we okay? Can, first, can you hear me back there? Hi. Um, and then, uh, does anybody, do we need a break or anything between? No, we're okay. Um, it, well, thank you for that lovely introduction. And, and th what you said about that novel is it's sort of at work, as you'll see in this um, the story. That, so I'm, I'm at least tentatively calling this collection of stories unreadable. Which, so I thought that was a good thing, because if any reviewer says, this is totally unreadable, they'll just be, yeah, they'll just be saying what it is. Doesn't that protect me? Actually, Sandy McClatchy, way back, and I was a 29-year-old writer, and he gave me my first good big review in a, a national newspaper. So I am so grateful to him. I was always scared of him because of that. I don't know if that makes sense. But. Um, anyway, the, so in this collection, what I'm doing is trying to write about, well, uh, uh, partly inspired by a, a quote from Nabokov. If you've read this wonderful, uh, I, it's, a, it's a novel of footnotes by Nabo Nabokov. This sounds really exciting, doesn't it? <laughs> Called Pale Fire. Uh, in it, buried inside is this quote. What if we awake one day all of us and find ourselves utterly unable to read. And I remember, I, I, I read that and I thought, oh, ooh, where are we now? You know, I'm watching my own university library. The, the books are disappearing, the collections being dispersed, they're getting rid of the books, and instead they're replacing it with tables that have plugs <laughs> for, and, and students can gather around on the plastic chairs and talk with one another for collaborative work and they're calling it this big empty space without books the knowledge gallery <laughs> so that I thought okay but this is it they're good things coming coming out of this <laughs> definitely <laughs> I'm reminded just quickly of um, the the son of Arnold Lobel the great children's book writer who was speaking about the internet and how it's just a terrible place for all sorts of greed and vanity, bullying, terrible things happen on the internet. And he said, 
No, that's not true. The internet is a wonderful place, a great means of communication, empowering, great space. It's humanity that stinks. <laughs> but here we are, with, you know, things are changing. And uh, so I'm writing each story, is, it, it, it takes on the question of reading. So stories about lost books, burned books, books that have been forgotten, uh, books that were never written, books that were never finished. Um, so in short, books that are all unreadable. <laughs> um, this this uh, uh, story, had, in honor of Nabokov, has a, just a few footnotes. <laughs> it's called Infidels. It was a damp November afternoon in Paris in 1887 when the man who would be identified in the book only as C suffered the first symptoms of the affliction that would make him noteworthy. He had risen from his nap and settled comfortably into his armchair by the window overlooking the Place des Vosges. Droplets from the thick fog ran like tears down the exterior of the glass. A wood fire crackled and filled the room with its soothing fragrance. One. I came across the story of C when I was browsing at a used bookstore in the lakeside village of Scaniatalus. I read the case history while standing in the aisle. Stupidly, I left without purchasing the book. When I returned for it later, the book was gone. I don't call the title. C's story, however, left an indelible impression in my mind. Long married but with no heirs, recently retired from a position as director of a champagne export business, C did not lack for friends. He and his wife dined out most evenings and he was an active member of the Société de Géographie. But C also guarded his solitude and spent most of his afternoons alone in his library. He was well educated and fluent in several languages. He longed to author something of his own but didn't know how to begin. He was secretly critical of contemporary men of letters and blamed novelists, especially, for pandering to the public and emptying their work of useful information. The worst of them, in his opinion, was Victor Hugo, who used to live in an apartment across the square. C had read a couple of novels and a book of verse by his former neighbor. He wasn't inclined to read more. He wasn't at all curious. What was there to be curious about if there was nothing to learn? He had read enough to reach the verdict that the whole of Hugo's oeuvre was overrated. In general, he preferred reading biographies and military histories. On this particular day in 1887, we find him reading a volume he purchased for a few francs from a bookseller near the Pont Marie. It was an English edition about the Crusades, and C was reading with interest about the disorder in the ranks of the early Christian pilgrims. Two, the book C was reading consisted of late chapters extracted from Edward Gibbon's classic work and republished in a pocket edition <coughs> titled simply, The Crusades. I have checked the quotes for accuracy. Quote, the vulgar, both the great and small, were taught to believe every wonder of lands flowing with milk and honey, he read. Quote, their ignorance of the country or war and discipline exposed them to every snare, he read. Quote, a pyramid of bones informed their companions of the place of their defeat, he read. And he continued to read the sentence stating that 300,000 perished before a single city was rescued from the, and then he stopped, or was stopped, as if he had run with his eyes closed into a brick wall. His eyes were wide open, but he couldn't read the word that followed in the sentence. The word was infidels. It should have been a familiar word to see, even if he hadn't been entirely fluent in English, since it was nearly identical in French, infidel. He knew the word in English just as he knew it in French. He knew it in Latin and Spanish. Really, it, it should have been easy for C to comprehend. Yet to his dismay, the word was utterly unintelligible. His eyes processed the letters in their correct order. His brain received the information in the usual fashion. He inhaled and his oxygenated blood flowed briskly. All organs were seemingly in working order and C was very much awake, utterly sober and self-aware. 
but the eight letters of that English word were as devoid of meaning as if he had never learned to read. It's true that many of us have experienced the odd momentary sensation when a simple word is suddenly unrecognizable. Scientists call this phenomenon semantic satiation and explain it as a result of overuse of a specific neural pattern. They hypothesize that intense repetition of a specific word creates a reactive inhibition, slowing the neural activity associated with the meaning of that word. We can read the word want, for instance, without difficulty, but reading it over and over interferes with comprehension. Want, 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 want. Three. One study has gone so far as to suggest that the recent dramatic uptick in this phenomenon is due to the simplification of writing necessitated by mobile devices. Smaller screens demand a smaller <coughs> vocabulary, increasing both our exposure to a smaller number of words and the concurrent increase in semantic satiation. See Leonardo T. Pisolorupad S. Marindiskuski JM28 Neurosemantic Frequency Pattern in Neuromorphological Studies, pages 132 to 145. <laughs> this, however, was not what C experienced that day in 1887. He didn't perceive the word as a familiar one that he'd once known. The letters were so unrecognizable that infidel wasn't even a word to him. It was a solid blankness, a splotch of spilled ink, and absolute nothing. He removed his spectacles, rubbed them with his handkerchief, and returned them to his face. The one printed word he didn't recognize became two, and two seeped into a sentence. He squinted, shifted in his chair, he opened the window shade. He tried to reread the preceding paragraph. With relief, he experienced some recognition. He knew what pyramid signified, and, and bones and defeat. Yes, he knew what each of those words meant, thank God. Pyramid, bones, defeat. Awareness was painfully brief. Pier, uh, bu, mm, de, it was as if the light within each letter went out one by one until each word was dark. With rising concern, he turned to words in his native language. He tried and failed to read the front page of the newspaper that lay open on his desk. The titles of the books on his shelves were unintelligible. He couldn't even read the name printed on his own stationery. Naturally, he would go on to consult his doctor. His doctor would refer him to a specialist who would study him with interest and publish his case history. That C retained his speaking fluency, gave the scientific community much to ponder. If you had conversed with him, you wouldn't have seen signs of his impairment, which affected only his perception of printed words. In other ways, he lived a normal life. For our purposes, however, it is enough to know that once C fully lost his ability to read, he never recovered it. I won't even bother telling you about his first appointment with his doctor. What concerns us here is C's adventure that day after he decided that all he needed was a good brisk walk around the square to clear his confused mind. Back in the early 1980s, when I was a student studying in Paris, I used to make my way to the Place des Vosges to get away from the bustle of the city. I remember how the streams of clear water gushed from the mouths of stone lions in the central fountain and the groomed lawns bordered by metal wickets, looked as perfect as if they'd been painted green. Linden trees grew in stately rows. An artificial hush seemed to mute the noise of traffic on the adjacent streets as if a volume dial had been adjusted. It was a warm spring that year, and I would sit on a bench and enjoy the sunlight on my face. One day, I fell into conversation with an old woman who was feeding crumbs to the pigeons. She saw my backpack and identified me as an American. She asked if I liked Paris. I said I liked it very much. She asked if I liked the Place des Vosges. I said I thought it was beautiful. Though the sky was clear, the woman wore a tan raincoat that was oversized on her small frame. Her cheeks had the deep creases of boots that had gone unworn for decades. 
She was eager to talk, and I was glad to have the chance to practice my French. When she asked, out of the blue, if I believed in ghosts, I said, oui, madame, yes, just to play along. And so it was from this old woman that I learned something about the bloody history of the Place des Vosges. Long ago, she explained to me as she tore off pinches of bread to toss to the birds, the large square was occupied by the Palais des Tournelles, named for numerous turrets that decorated its rim. It was here in the courtyard of the palace that Henri II was wounded in a tilting match with the Duke of Montgomery, whose peer splintered against the king's visor, sending shards through his eyes and into his brain. The king suffered for 11 days in painful agony before finally dying. In mourning, his wife, Catherine de Medici, ordered the palace to be destroyed. This is where a ghost enters the story. The old woman claimed the Place des Vosges was haunted by the king. I asked her whether she had ever seen the king herself. And sir, she said, of course. It was impossible to predict when he would make an appearance. Some said he came on the nights when Venus was closest to Earth, while others maintained that he could be seen during the lunar eclipse or on the anniversary of his death or birth or marriage. He would appear in his armor suit, walking slowly across the grass to the fountain. He would remove his helmet with his broken visor and dip his hands into the water, being spit out by one of the stone lions. He would wash the blood from his face, then he would put his helmet back on and walk away. The old woman was 14 years old when she had first seen the king on her way home from a tavern where she worked sweeping the floors. She had seen him three times since then. With a theatrical grimace, she tried to convey how frightening he was to behold. When her, with her lips peeled back, I saw that she was missing several upper molars. I didn't bother to wait around to see if the ghost of Henri II would make his entrance that evening. It had become increasingly obvious to me that the woman was suffering from senility. I could only hope that she was receiving adequate care. As for me, though I appreciate a good ghost story, I thought I could tell the difference between fiction and fact until I stumbled across the story of C. <laughs> My sense of C is that he was even more of a skeptic than yours truly. He must certainly have been aware of the square's history, but superstition made him impatient. And though he was a dutiful Catholic and went to confession once a week, he much preferred forms, preferred forms of knowledge that could be verified. When in doubt, he would always side with duplicable proof. As for human attempts to expose the secrets of mortality, he believed that the truth was visible in every corpse. You could see just by looking at a man without a heartbeat that death was the end of life. There was no world elsewhere. C was convinced that heaven and hell existed only as imagined places. His pragmatic mind had no room for phantoms. The fog that had settled over the city of Paris the day C lost his ability to read was so dense, and the winter dusk had come so early that he could barely make out the outlines of the tall buildings across the square. He felt the unnerving sensation of being lost, though he knew exactly where he was. He resisted the urge to grab the arm of a woman who was walking ahead of him along the gravel path. Feathers sticking up from the bulb of her hat shook in the swirling mist. C gasped, mistaking the feathers for a live bird. He took a few steps backward and would have stumbled, but luckily his hand found the iron handle of a bench. He lowered himself onto the seat. With a few deep breaths, he was able to calm his agitation. The quiet of the square had restorative effect, and he began to appreciate the effect of the fog on the scenery. It would have been fine weather for spectral illusions. So he smiled at the thought. Of course, he'd heard the silly stories about the king, Henri II. He enjoyed the feeling of superiority that overcame him when he considered how susceptible other people were to superstition, how easily they would mistake a tree trunk blurred by the heavy cloud for the ghost of a dead king. He tipped his head back and closed his eyes. 
Voices of passers-by seemed to come from far away. He could almost fancy that he was at the seashore. He found himself remembering the sensation he'd loved so much when he was a young boy and let the gentle waves wash the sand over his toes. A nearby cough had the startling effect of shattering glass. See blinked. That's when he noticed the man at the opposite end of the bench. He didn't know how long the man had been there. Probably he had just arrived. He wore an old-fashioned sack suit with a tailcoat that was unbuttoned, revealing a plaid vest in the froth of a white ruffled shirt. His black cravat was tied in a bow and brushed against the rough curls of his white beard. He had a pencil out and was writing on a piece of paper. His expression had the fixed aspect of a statue and gave little indication of his thoughts. <coughs> From C's perspective, there was an air of loneliness about the man, a profuse, sad loneliness that kept him helplessly sealed off from the rest of humanity. C tried not to stare. There was something familiar about the stranger. A moment of reflection brought clear identification as C recognized his former neighbor, Victor Hugo. <laughs> Victor Hugo. But that was impossible. Victor Hugo was dead. He had been dead for two years. C had been inconvenienced by the author's huge funeral procession in front of the Pantheon. <coughs> oh, but it was him. There was no denying. Victor Hugo, buried in a tomb he shared with Zola and Dumas, was sitting beside C on an iron bench in the Place des Vosges. C was overtaken by a clarity of mind that came in stark contrast to the confusion he'd experienced earlier. He could no longer find meaning in printed words, but he could see reality for what it was. Hugo brought the back of his hand to his mouth <clears throat> and coughed again. He was old and haggard, but his poor health couldn't stop him from scribbling on the paper. So he felt a wave of pity for Hugo and reached to, wanted to reach out to him and tell him, what? What could he possibly say? He searched his memory for a passage from one of the author's verses. Instead, a scene from the famous early novel about the hunchback came to mind. He remembered the passage almost word for word. He remembered how jolly the little pet goat of La Esmeralda gets her, his horns tangled in the folds of a noblewoman's dress. C's heart ached as he thought of all the ugly, contemptuous aristocrats mocking La Esmeralda, calling her a witch and ordering her to make the goat perform a feat of magic. C wasn't prone to sentimentality, but who could resist when the actors on the page were so vividly rendered? It occurred to him that he had judged Hugo's work too harshly through the years. His inclination to find faults had dominated his reading experience. He realized that in his urge to be critical, he had missed the sheer absorbing pleasure of Hugo's books. Why he had only to gaze at the sad, decrepit ghost beside him and realize that the stories he'd left behind would survive the eroding effects of time. The centuries would pass, and the books would continue to be read, though not by C, since C could no longer read. Four. C was probably wrong about the survival of Victor Hugo's books. Predictive patterns based on data by Leonardo et al. Ibid, indicates that by the year 2150, the majority of the human species will be illiterate. <laughs> Awareness filled him with horror. He would never again be able to read about La Esmeralda disentangling Jolly's horns from Madame Alois's dress. He didn't need a doctor to examine him to conclude with absolute certainty that his impairment was permanent. Printed words forever on would be impenetrable. If he wanted to read, he would have to be read to. It wasn't the same when the words were spoken aloud. No, it wasn't at all the same as digesting words visually and letting them transport him far from his armchair into a world illuminated by the light of his solitary consciousness. He had failed to fully savor the distinct satisfaction that comes with reading selflessly, propelled by selfless interest. All through his adult life, when his intellect was at its sharpest, he had positioned himself in competition with the books in his library. Now it was too late to start over. He had missed his chance. Casting a sorrowful glance at C, 
Victor Hugo stood, fluffed at the tails of his coat, and walked away. Sea resisted calling out to him. He watched silently as the ghost dissolved in the mist. After Victor Hugo had disappeared entirely, Sea bravely fought against despair and invited a return of cold common sense. He told himself that he had imagined the whole encounter. There had been no ghost. He said it over and over to himself. There had been no ghost. He would have been persuaded if he hadn't seen, beside him on the bench, the piece of paper Victor Hugo left behind. C was reluctant to pick it up. It would cause him too much distress since he wouldn't be able to read what Hugo had written. It would only be painful to peruse the scrawl of ink and fail to make sense of it. Hugo had probably written something brilliant. C would never know. He would leave the paper there. He would not allow himself to be tormented. But an unusual curiosity overtook him, and he gingerly lifted a corner of the paper and scrutinized it. He was able to perceive a lacy confection made of graphite. It took extra scrutiny in the dim light to realize he was not looking at words, but at a drawing. At first, it seemed a busy pattern design, flowers tumbling behind a web. But with further consideration, he came to see the circles, one dark, one hollow, that represented eyes, and a grim, skewed oval of a mouth lined with monstrous teeth, and wisps of a beard trailing like Medusa snakes. See, finally recognized in the image the shape of a ghostly face dissolving into a net of lines as if printed on lace. Victor Hugo had left behind a drawing. This was his gift to see, who from that day on could no longer read, but could see with perfect clarity. In the picture Victor Hugo had made in C's presence, C saw the self-portrait of the very ghost with whom he had shared the bench. It did not take much effort to see that the illustration succeeded in capturing all the mysterious brilliance of the artist on a single sheet of paper. He was filled with admiration, and at the same time he perceived in the image the full imaginative depths he'd missed in the previous years. It felt as if he were looking through ice at a spectacular underwater garden. The effect of the drawing was so disorienting that in the days to come, C would put it in a drawer out of sight. Anyway, medical examinations and experimental treatments would keep him so busy, he wouldn't have time for anything else. He decided that rather than leave the drawing to languish in his desk, he would donate it to the city of Paris. When the Victor Hugo Museum was established on the Place des Vosges in 1902, it would be displayed among the author's papers in a second floor gallery. It remains there to this day. I know, for I've seen it myself. <laughs> Thank you so much and, and, uh, for giving us a chance to do this together, um, to, to Willard. Uh, uh, to, Questions. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I should ask uh, the boss, do we have time for a couple of questions? Have we overstayed our welcome? Yes. Where is it? Yes, we've overstayed our welcome. <laughs> okay, I was looking for Belinda back there. Oh, she's uh, uh, Yes. <laughs> Let, let me have both Jim and Joanna come up here and let them ask you for whatever you wish to ask them. <laughs> that song. Is it toast to all those who love us? Is it toast to all those who love us? I don't know, Joanna. Do, 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 do you think we should let them do this? Or? <laughs> I can't. I can't. You can ask each other. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what have you wanted right? to ask me all these years? <laughs> Uh, if anybody has any questions, they're of course happy to answer them. What has intrigued you most about this little village that you've been visiting? There's a lot to say. <laughs> but I, I think I'll, I will. Um, I, I will 
say something more specific about living in the Merrill apartment that has been for both of us extremely moving. Um, one of the things that's completely obvious about the library there, though if you didn't think about it, it might not occur to you, is that it's the world of American letters from about 1960 to 1985 frozen in time. And it's as if nothing has happened since then when you're in that space with those books. And because that's the world of American letters that we grew up in and aspired to belong to, it's as if we're back in the wonder of, of you know, look, 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 there are those, look at all those John Barth novels in a row, and, and you know, Donald Finkel, wow, he's amazing. Uh, you know, not necessarily people that, that, that even get talked about anymore, but you feel the, the dignity and the honor of, of that time period and, and to feel a, a, you know, connected to that has been extremely moving for us. I, I, I guess I'll just add that um, other than the seemingly bottomless bottles of wine that appear <laughs> occasionally, <laughs> I, the uh, community here is, is, is really extraordinary. Tim didn't read it, but he, he has a poem about the Burrow and I, uh, and, and yeah, no, it's like, wait, is your name in it? <laughs> um, but I, uh, the, the, it is. I, both of us feel it's it's a kind of place that we had imagined before we got here, to have a place that's beautiful where there are so many interesting people, um, and yet still small like this. It just seems quite magical. So um, it, you know, there's a ton ton more to say about it, and uh, you know, I. I, I I don't know what kind of impression we've been giving you over the last few months. That's kind of, <laughs> I'd be curious. Can, can I ask a question? <laughs> uh, tell me a little bit about your writing routines. Mm -hmm. uh, you're rather unique because you're both writers and you're uh, a couple. Mm -hmm. uh, have you mm -hmm. found any, any places very special here that uh, helped you to, to focus? Or get into the group. Well, it, for me, I, I, I'm the one who who took the seat at, at James Merrill's desk because for, for Jim it was he, just surrounded by the poetry he knew so well. It, it felt at, at the beginning, at least, uh, overwhelming. And I, I I I heard that that's not untypical of the residents who come in that it's the prose writers who sit at the desk and the poets sit in the Jackson apartment. Um, so that, uh, I, I have found that to be an extraordinary place to work, partly as Jim was describing in the books, but partly the, the light outside the window. It's, it's, it's one place I've ever worked where I can sit at almost any time. And, and I, I can go away and come back and start working again. I, I, I'm usually not able to do that. If, if I'm interrupted, I can't regain that space, but I've been able to do that there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. The, uh, the, the ambiance of being here and waking up every morning and walking the damn dog <laughs> is <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> uh, and, but there's, there's another... I think Joanna gives all the answers that will be about looking out at the world, and I'll give all the answers that will be about kind of. <laughs> uh, That's why we go together. So. <laughs> but you know, we've been we've been writing together for almost forty years, and and you know, every single sentence that each of us has written, the other has read and reread many times. And just to be back, and we used to do that, you know, in, you know, tiny little apartments together, you know. <laughs> and so to be back in this, you know, it's it's a, it's a very small apartment, but I, I I just love being there because it's like it's like being a, a young student together again, but not being really poor. <laughs> <laughs> and the feeling of that is 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 really delicious to me. Could, could you talk about your hours of work and what time you start, what time you knock off? <laughs> Well, you all probably already know that because you're watching us, right? <laughs> when do I get back from my run in the morning? <laughs> uh, so, well, we actually have different kind of rhythms of, of working. We always have. Our, our daughter is from Boston, is in the back, hey, Catherine. 
Um, but she knows that uh, I, I, at home in Rochester, I've worked up in the attic for many uh, years in the attic office, and I go up there and I'm just there and I stay. If you're a prose writer, you have to do that. You stay at your, you sit at your desk and you don't move for hours and hours at a time. So that, that generally takes me once I start sort of in the, sometime in the morning. I like to get a lot of activity for me. Then I, I, I can sit. For, for hours, and I just read the New York Times today that sitting is terrible for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, great poet and dear friend of James Merrill, Elizabeth Bishop, once said that when you're a poet, you can't write all the time, and that's a good thing, too. Uh, and the rest of the time, you can either write literary criticism or drink. It really doesn't make a <laughs> um, So uh, um, the drinking here has been <laughs> really prima. <laughs> Where are you all? <laughs> I have had cocktails I've never heard of. <laughs> um, but th there is a sense also that I think not, not just with Joanna squirreled in the attic, there's a sense we're, we're kind of, when you're a writer, you're kind of working all the time, all the time, uh, no matter what you're doing. Uh, and, and, then, and so the place where you are really matters to feel comfortable with this mind that is at, this, at once uh, a wonder and a, and a burden. Uh, uh, so again, being here has been very important. Let me just run one more question for you. Uh, you could have picked a number of French uh, 19th century novelists. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how come he the I, I, so the question was why for this? Because it, 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 you know, any French novelist could have uh, appeared in the Place des Vosges. Well, actually, not any, because the Victor Hugo Museum is in the Place des Vosges. So there was that. But also because he's a novelist, I, I, I love and find so absorbing. So I just you can disappear into the work, that feeling of forgetting where you are and 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 living inside the the, the world of the, the fiction that's through my life is with uh, Hugo's work's been so delicious. Um, so I wanted to to think about someone who was so cynical who who refused to feel that, and 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 then you get to point. I just, Gee, did I make a mistake about that? Uh, and and then try to give a sense that that you know how important it is that we open ourselves up and try to let ourselves feel that. So, um, maybe one more question. Is there? No. No. Oh. What's next? Where are you off to next? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we teach. <laughs> well, yeah, we we'll, uh, like to teach in the fall. <laughs> uh, but we we love to teach. I just shouldn't shouldn't put it that way. Uh, it's, that's been an amazing uh, privilege to be able to do that all these years. Um, and we're both in you know in the middle of books, uh, and and uh, we're not you know sometimes you're at a stage where you really really don't know what you're doing next. But we're we're both in the middle of things right now, and 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 they seem to be swimming along. So, future looks good.